health outcomes, changes due to interventions. To bring positive change, patient experiences and health must both improve. Healthcare costs must be lowered, and clinician and staff burnout has to end. But our problems are big. 133 million Americans have at least one chronic disease. Half a million people are dying every year from hospital errors, injuries, and infection. The shortage of primary care professionals will be as much as 100,000 in just the next five years. Big problems require bigger solutions. Positive change needs acceleration. It needs to happen now. But these are not so easy solutions that many don't want to hear, and even few are willing to talk about. How to lead such a change? How to discover, discuss, and disrupt healthcare to make a difference now? This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Vitals. Vitals is meant to be an open and transparent forum for us to discuss America's biggest healthcare issues and how transformational leaders are leading change to improve the delivery of care, quality, and access. Vitals are the tools that these leaders use, value, innovation, technology, advocacy, leadership, and service. And before I introduce today's speaker, I do want to recognize that tomorrow is Veterans Day. Please go out of your way to recognize and thank a veteran for their service. I received an email today from one of our graduates, Dr. Fred Martinez, who is deployed at al Deed Air Base with the 379th Expeditionary Medical Group. Our thoughts go out to him. This is his second deployment since I've had the opportunity to be present here at Neomed. He and our other great veterans are out taking care of us and serving our country. Today is also the 247th birthday of the United States Marine Corps. Wrong. With Veterans Day, and the Marine Corps' birthday, there couldn't be a more appropriate leader to speak to us today in the Vitals Forum. I don't want to miss anything on this very important speaker who could be looked at as a leader of leaders. So I'm gonna break with tradition and actually read directly from his bio because I don't want to miss any of the important details. Today, we're gonna to hear from Vice Admiral Dr. Forrest Faison, a Norfolk and Norfolk, Virginia and Cleveland, Ohio native who received his bachelor's degree at Wake Forest University and then went on to receive his doctor of medicine and surgery at the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. He completed his residency in pediatrics at Naval Hospital San Diego and completed fellowship training in neurodevelopmental pediatrics at the University of Washington. Dr. Faison served as the 38th Surgeon General of the Navy up until no December of 2019. As Surgeon General, CEO, and Chief Medical Officer, he was responsible for the Global Navy and Marine Corps healthcare system and all medical care to Navy and Marine Corps units, personnel, and other eligible beneficiaries. He led a team of over 67,000 caring for 2.6 million patients in 128 medical centers, hospitals, and clinics, in addition to two 1,000 bed hospital ships with an annual operating budget of $9.6 billion and over $3 billion in research funding. He also led a global medical education enterprise of over 140 fully accredited graduate education training programs, serving over 1,000 physicians and 5,000 nurses and medical technicians. Before his service, as the Navy's Surgeon General, Dr. Faison also served as Deputy Surgeon General and as Commander Navy Medicine West, where he coordinated the Navy's medical support and relief operations, the government of Japan during Fukushima, Fukushima earthquake and tsunami, 
and Navy's Chief of Health Operations. He also led the Navy's relief effort for earthquake ravaged Haiti. Dr. Faison was most recently the Senior Vice President for Research and Innovation and Chief Health Strategy and Chief Medical Officer at Cleveland State University. He is an internationally recognized and published author and speaker on leadership, high reliability health care, and value-based care, virtual care, social determinants of health and health disparities, and the future of health care. The way you assess a leader best is how the people they're leading think about them. On a personal note, before I joined Neomed, I had the pleasure and honor of spending time on the USS Mercy off the coast of Malaysia for Pacific Partnership. And there I had the opportunity to hear from hundreds of Navy sh shipmen and Navy enlisted members who were speaking about this incredible leader they had and how excited they were to be able to meet him that day. And I looked over near the serving line in the cafeteria and there was Dr. Faison. This is the person they were speaking of. Really excited to have uh, Dr. Faison with us here today. Please join me on the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'll, I'll tell you, it's wonderful to be back home in Ohio. Uh, and also be here at Neomed. Uh, it's a real privilege and honor for me to have the opportunity to speak with you today. What an amazing institution. You all are doing some incredible, incredible things here. And I just wanna say thank you for that. You know, the folks that you help, you may never meet, but I will tell you, they are more grateful than you will ever know. And so I wanna say thank you for that. I wanna talk a little bit about today and do a deep dive, military term, on a concept that we've all known about that even some of us even talk about, and it's the foundation of medicine. And that is, we care for people. We care for our patients. But what does that really mean? What does it really mean? And are there limits to caring? And I'd like to look at that today um, in, in observance of Veterans Day through the lens of America's wounded warriors. You've heard about wounded warriors um, during an Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts. Um, we heard a lot about wounded warriors. We don't hear so much about them today. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is and what that means going forward. So I'd like you to think about what does it mean to care for our patients? Are there limits to that? Does caring end at the front door of the clinic? Uh, and how does that how does that apply to wounded warriors and to other populations that we'll talk about? So let's let's talk and do a little deep dive on this. I'm gonna I'm a little techno challenge, so I'm gonna try and do this without messing up the slides. Okay. So wounded warriors, you know, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, we had the highest combat survival in recorded history. And we have data going back to the Revolutionary War. If you had a survivable injury on the battlefield, uh, you had a 97% chance of survival, 97%. Um, we were routinely saving men and women who would have died in any previous conflict. And these are young men and women in their early 20s, late teens, um, who came home uh, alive uh, and with their entire lives ahead of them. 97% uh, combat survival. The nation spared no expense to care for them. Uh, we had every advantage in those conflicts, from time of injury all the way back to, to care at Walter Reed, San Antonio, and San Diego. We spared no expense to care for them and to rehabilitate and help them to recover. Uh, and again, every single one of them had their entire lives ahead of them. No expense was spared during those conflicts to care for those young men and women and set them up for success going forward. Uh, this was a population of men and women, uh, our patients who had volunteered to serve, raised their hand when the nation needed them and said, send me. Uh, and we spared no expense to care for them and to help them recover from their injuries. So what happened to them? Since we don't hear too much about them, what happened to these men and women after they left? 98% of them did not return to active duty. They went, went on and back to civilian life, back to their homes where they came from. What happened to these wounded warriors? As near as we can tell, and there's not good data on this, there are a little over 152,000 men and women that could be considered 
wounded warriors. Uh, and that runs the gamut from those with traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder, all the way through amputees. The, these are American heroes, and there are about 152,000 of them. Approximately 22,000 veterans are homeless. What you can't see is very well is that picture in the background with those tents. When I was privileged to be the commander of the medical center in San Diego, San Diego is a very military friendly town. It's the home of, of the third fleet of the Navy. Uh, a lot of military veterans live there uh, and are employed there. It is a very military friendly town. But despite being military friendly town, there were approximately a thousand homeless veterans living in Balboa Park, which is the big, big city park in the center of town. Um, most of them were in their early 20s because they came back to San Diego. And as you know, to get a job today, you got to have a network. Well, it's hard to have a network when you're in combat and then you come home to all engrossing medical care and recovery. So we, they left to go to the civilian sector with no network and they were homeless. So we, we took our tents and every year, twice a year, we set up those tents in Balboa Park for what was called um, Operation Home Front to help care for them and um, veterans stand down. Um, and we would bring these homeless vets in and give them immunizations, make sure they had clothes, try and find them a place to live if they had substance abuse issues. We, uh, we um, got them into treatment, got them eyeglasses if they needed it. Um, and, and I always gave the opening talk to the people that volunteered to help, help run this. And one year when I did this, there was a young man that the entire time I was talking, this young man probably was about 24 years old, no shoes, homeless, stood at attention the entire time I was talking. And I went up and talked to him and his story was pretty typical. Um, came from a, a tiny town in the Midwest, joined the army uh, as a way to, uh, to better himself, was wounded, got out, um, couldn't get a job and was living in Balboa Park. So we took him under our wings, of course, and, and took care of him. So 20,000 were homeless. Approximately 36,000 have got substance abuse issues. Interestingly, um, in, the, in the Veterans Village, which is a, a institution in San Diego that, uh, that cares for homeless veterans, 85% of the females have got substance abuse issues, 85%. Um, so what's our plan for that? And we'll talk about that in just a second. One out of every four veterans has had suicidal ideation. And every single day, 20 veterans kill themselves. Every single day. The preponderance of those are, are um, veterans from OIF and Operation um, Enduring Freedom. Approximately 20%, one out of five, have got post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and you know, the, as we do longitudinal studies, that if you have untreated PTSD, you have a 200% increased risk of developing a chronic disease because you don't take care of yourself. Uh, and, and so um, a lot of these challenges are ahead. 16% um, of these veterans are unemployed. Um, and of those that are disabled, um, if you look at the maximum payout that the, that the VA will provide these veterans, um, it is less than what they need and less than the average cost of living. Um, and when you compare it to what's required for a living wage, it's less than a living wage. Uh, and so uh, what's our plan for that? And we'll talk about that in just a second. All right. Oh, I'm stuck here. There we go. Okay. Well, that gap is getting worse. That gap is getting worse. Every year, the VA increases the cost of living adjustments for, for the uh, disability benefits that wounded warriors get. And that, that cost of living adjustment is anywhere from two and a half to almost 6% this year, which is great. Except when you realize inflationary growth is at eight and a half percent. And there's wide variation. As I put some of the inflationary numbers from the Midwest um, here so you could see this. Furthermore, because of inflation, uh, there had always been a safety net of philanthropic organizations to care for folks and make up the difference. But because of inflationary challenges of, of Americans today, giving to those philanthropic organizations is decreased. I'm on the board of a philanthropic organization that cares for wounded warriors. We've seen a 20% decrease over the last year in donations. Um, so worsening inflation, 
Um, their disability pay and benefits is not keeping pace. The safety net that has always been in place to care for them um, has become challenged because of, because of economic factors. So there are some key strategic questions. And when I was a Surgeon General and, and as a flag officer, every time I went to testify up on Capitol Hill or visited uh, congressional uh, leaders um, or had them visit our hospitals, I always asked them three questions. And those three questions are right here. Less than 1% of our nation serves today in uniform. Less than 1% will wear the cloth of our nation. Um, and yet we are dependent on them for our security, our stability, and to ensure that we pass on to our children the greatest gift we will ever leave them, the gift of freedom, but less than 1%. Um, and because of advances in medical practice and other technological innovations, they are coming home wounded, but they're surviving their injuries with their entire life ahead of them. So what should their future look like? What should the future of wounded warriors look like for them and for their families? What is our national strategy to achieve that future? And what's the role of the government and of industry and of the medical profession and community leaders? And of all the people that I asked over about the 10 years that I was a, a flag officer in the Navy, no one could answer these questions. So what does that mean? There is no plan. There is no plan when we have an all volunteer force in a world that is increasingly unstable and challenged. You all have seen in the paper what's going on in the world today. Um, we are reliant on a force to protect us and secure our freedoms, and we have no plan to care for them when they come home after they've, after they've gone through their initial medical um, rehabilitation um, and recovery. So what's our responsibility as medical leaders? You know, when you look at, as, as providers, the studies are pretty clear that what we actually do in the exam room really only influences about 15 to 20% of our patients' outcomes. And the amount of time that the average patient will spend in the presence of a healthcare provider over a course of a year is about 0.007%. So, so clearly health is not determined in the exam room. Clearly the care of our patients is not solely determined in the exam room. It's outside. What's our responsibility? Does our responsibility to care for our patients end at the front door or not? What does that mean? And how do we respond to that? Uh, so all of us are in the profession of caring, of medicine, of healthcare, um, to care for others. What exactly does that mean? And do we have responsibilities outside of the exam room, outside the front door of our clinic? Now, I've talked about wounded warriors today. I'd like you to ask that same question about other vulnerable populations and other populations at risk. And this is particularly relevant for Northeast Ohio. And perhaps we'll talk about that during the Q&A. But what is our national plan for some of our most vulnerable people? We spend more on healthcare than any other nation on earth, more on healthcare, and yet we don't have the best outcomes. And there's wide variability, depending on whether or not you're insured, depending on your means, depending on your zip code. Um, and so what is our plan for the men and women who are in these vulnerable populations to be participants in the American dream. And that's what I would ask you to think about today. So as we get ready to celebrate Veterans Day tomorrow and thank our veterans, those men and women who have raised their hand and served and sacrificed and worn the cloth of our nation to defend us, think about what's the plan to care for them. Think about what should we as a nation do to not only say thank you, but to ensure this less than 1% that serves the best of that generation, we don't lose their contributions, we don't lose their service, we don't lose all that they can bring to our nation in the future. Think about that tomorrow during Veterans Day, and then expand your thinking to think about what about all the other Americans who need our help today? That's the challenge of medical leadership in the future. And so I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about a subject that I'm incredibly, as you can tell, hopefully passionate about, and that is 
our wounded warriors who have served and sacrificed and given so much to ensure that we pass on to our children the gift of freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's now my privilege to, to welcome to the stage a very good friend of mine, uh, Monica Robbins from WKYC, uh, who I've known for quite a while. And Monica, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Is this thing on? Okay. All right, we're gonna get to the Q&A portion of our presentation today. So if any of you in the audience have a question for Dr. Faison, please uh, just make your way to one of these microphones. And for those of you who are watching virtually, uh, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom. I have my computer and I'll be glad to ask your questions. I wanna start with one of my own. And uh, one of that is relating to uh, wounded veterans and also the amount of uh, the number of veterans who commit suicide every day. Um, my understanding is when many of these veterans came home from deployment, they always have a debrief. Mm -hmm. One of the issues I heard from several of them was that signing up for VA benefits, mental health resources, anything like that was never mentioned in the debrief. It was almost as if once you go back to civilian life, you're on your own and you got to figure out setting up yourself for the VA. Has that changed or is that still standard? It has changed. The, the VA has done a, a really a great job in increasing their services, increasing the access and availability and doing outreach um, to veterans as they come home. But one of our challenges is um, there's not enough mental health resources. Um, health and Human Services did a study about, about three or four years ago that showed that across the United States, there were a little over 3,000 counties that had no flavor of mental health provider whatsoever. Um, be, because if you look at the economics of medical education, um, mental health doesn't pay. You know, the average medical student will graduate with a little over $200,000 in debt. Um, and so if you look at, okay, how do you pay those, those bills off? We did studies on this in the Navy. If you go into something like orthopedics, which pays pretty well, um, not pediatrics, but orthopedics, um, it takes you 17 years to pay your loans off. If you go into pediatrics, internal medicine, family practice, or mental health, you never pay your loans off. You're in debt your entire professional career. Uh, and so people are not going into mental health um, that have, because they've got to pay their loans off. So, so we have a challenge, not just with the wounded warriors and the veterans, but how do we, how do we provide mental health services for all Americans? And so what you're seeing in the wounded warriors and, and with the veterans is a microcosm of a much larger issue that our nation is facing of ensuring that what drives, um, what, what services are available and offered isn't economics, but the needs of Americans. Um, let me go to Rod's question. So many veterans become leaders for some of the world's top organizations. So what is it about armed forces training and experiences that prepare them so well? I, I, I'll tell you, I have never been so proud to be an American as when I got the opportunity to work with some of the corpsmen and young, young officers that, that Dr. Langell talked about, um, because all of them join our military um, because they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. They want to make a difference and they want to help. Uh, and, and so I think just as a baseline, men and women who enter our military today have got that mindset, have got that discipline, have got that ethos, if you will, of service to others and of making a difference. And then you add on the things that, that the military teaches them, core values for the Navy, it's honor, courage, and commitment. Um, it's, it's the importance of teamwork and being part of a team. It, it's putting the other person first. It's servant leadership. Um, and those things don't go away when you leave military service. Those things are with you in what I call a toolkit that you can take with you to give back to our nation. Uh, and that's what I think makes the difference for folks that have served in the military. What is your advice to future doctors and future healthcare professionals? Why should they consider enlisting? Uh, that's a great question. So, so I'll share with you how I ended up there. When I decided to go into a career in medicine, um, the, you know, I went into the military and, and my plan was I was going to stay for a few years and, and get out. 
Um, but I stayed for a few reasons. Number one was the opportunity and privilege to work with these young men and women every day. The, the second was to be part of something bigger than myself, to ensure that we pass on to our children a world that's better than the world that was left to us. And the third was I could practice medicine without ever having to ask a patient how sick they could afford to be. Um, and I found that very attractive. Still waiting on any of you to come up to one of those microphones. Don't be shy. Uh, but I'll continue with our Zoom uh, questions. You mentioned substance abuse and suicidal ideation among veterans. There are similar issues of concern among our physicians with stress and trauma being a common cause. What other parallels might there be with military service and providing health care? And what can providers learn from those in the military? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. The, the thing that kept me up at night when I was the Surgeon General was our medical team, because there's one person in a unit that's going to see every single casualty, and it's the hospital corpsman. Uh, and I worried about them the most, because most of our corpsmen have been out of high school less than five years. Um, many of them have never seen blood before. And now we're putting them in charge of a platoon or a larger unit of, of service members um, to save their life. Um, and, and, and although the casualties were not, you know, so great in Iraq and Afghanistan that we overwhelmed the healthcare system, they were individually horrific. Um, and, and I worry about that with them. So we put in place several programs to increase resilience. Um, we put in program in place programs to help folks to deal with what is really an unnatural event. You know, war is event. Our suicide amongst our corpsmen, we really didn't have suicide, you know. And the other thing that we did was to, to what Dr. Langel talked about. Um, we made people feel like they were part of a family, you know. And, and when you're part of a family, family members look out for each other. And, and so putting in place programs to increase resilience, to help them deal with these things, and, and setting a mindset of, hey, we're all part of a family here and we care for each other, I think really bore fruit for us. One of our Zoom participants writes, I think we should deliver this information to our politicians and the president's office. I'm sure they do not know about this, and that's the reason they do not help our veterans. It will be good to bring to our politicians' attention so they can deliver your message to the president's office. Have you ever tried to deliver this information? It, I, how many times have you spoke on the Hill? Yeah. So, so I testified probably on the Hill more times than I can count um, and visited with folks. And um, every time, every time I was on the Hill, I talked about this um, because one of the jobs of leadership is to, is to raise the tough issues. Cause, cause if you won't do it, who will, you know, people, they put you in leadership positions, not, not to be popular, not to sing happy tunes, but, but to tackle these tough issues and bring them to leadership attention. Uh, and so every time I was on the Hill, I did that, but, but, you know, our, 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 uh, our elected officials have got challenges just like just like others. And uh, and this is one. And so I, I think it's a, a recurring issue of just continuing to remind them that, hey, you have an all volunteer force. And today, less than one percent of our nation serves and our stability, our way of life, our our um, United States, if you will, is dependent on global security, especially now um, because we're in a global economy. You know, well over 90% of the goods and services we use in our lives come from uh, to us from overseas. You know, 98% of telecommunications occurs by underwater cables. All of that requires protection. Um, and all that requires response. All that requires somebody being on watch around the world. That's that less than 1%. Um, and every mom and dad in America is looking at how well we take care of them to help influence whether or not their son or daughter comes to join us. George Washington had a very, very salient quote um, that he said, he says, the, the willingness by which men and women will volunteer to serve their country is in direct proportion to how well they perceive veterans of previous conflicts were treated and appreciated by their nation. He's right. We have a question from our audience. I believe that's Dr. Langell. Yes, thank you. Dr. Faison, I'm really interested in your thoughts and potentially the progress we may have made. At least the state of the art three years ago, 
our servicemen and women from across the different branches were cared for in medical treatment facilities at the bases they were located. When they went to expeditionary outposts, they often brought their medical records with them. We're using an entirely different electronic record system that didn't communicate with their own branch of service back home. And then when they returned, they would bring their records with them. And the wounded warriors would then go out of service and be handed to the VA. The v typically, those medical records would be archived, made available nationally, often in paper form. And there was no transition to the VA and no really continuity of not no continuity of care that was being provided between the providers who were taking care of that that hero. What are we doing differently? Are we doing anything differently? And if not, how would you envision fixing the problem? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Thank you, Dr. Langel. Um, I, I think we've made progress. Um, both the VA and the Department of Defense have selected a single vendor. Um, for the electronic health record, um, so that there is communication between the VA and, and DOD. There, there are some challenges with interfaces and things like that, but I think I think that forms a good foundation. Our, our challenge is really a microcosm of a larger challenge of American healthcare. When you go to see your primary care doc, that doc has got access to about 20% of your medical information. So when you go to see your physician, um, you're getting cared for by a provider who is only able to look at one out of every five pages of your medical record. That's a real problem um, because there are about 300 medical uh, electronic health records in the United States right now. And as we bring uh, and become more um, inclusive of our reserve colleagues who get their care in the civilian sector, as the military health system draws down and more folks are sent to the civilian sector, um, as the VA outsources more care, none of them have got the same common electronic health record. Um, and yet having that complete record is essential for good quality care, to avoid care duplication, to avoid um, untoward events, and, and for the VA to get a, get a disability rating. So, so we're involved, one of the things that I'm involved in right now is um, a, uh, the great thing about, about this age is technology. Um, and so I'm involved um, with a company that's got an app that um, is on your phone. And um, with some basic demographic information, it will go out to every health information exchange around the world and pull in all your medical information. And then you own that information. You have to give permission to the physician to use it. But, but, which is important because if you think about it, the medical, your medical information is the only information you don't own. Um, you own that medical information, but it, now it's a complete medical record that regardless of where you are in the world, regardless of who's caring for you, you have on your phone um, your complete medical record. And that is secured by some cybersecurity um, technology um, that we've wrapped around this that comes from the intelligence in special forces communities um, that's never been hacked. Because as you know, medical information today is the number one data sold on the dark web because you can do so much bad stuff with it. Um, there are nation states, China, a couple others that are actively seeking to hack into medical systems. There was a health system up in New England last year where, where hackers got in and actually got to, to equipment that touched patients and started turning it off. Um, just And they turned it back on, but it was a demonstration. Well, think about the impact that that could have to the will to fight if you don't know if your medical information is going to be secure, things like that. So one of the things that we're working on is let's create a complete medical record, secure it um, so that it can't be hacked and give you control over it as the service member that you can take with you. And you say, well, what happens when your phone gets stolen? Well, what happens is if your phone gets stolen, somebody just tries to sign in um, to your phone that, and, and, and they don't do it right the first time, that app disappears. So, so whoever stole your phone doesn't even know that's on your phone right there. And it has to be, has to be revalidated every 10 microseconds. Um, that's why the intelligence communities are using it. So what we're trying to do, it's a long answer, is look at technological ways to bring all that information so that the doc caring for you doesn't have 20% of the information, it's got 100% of your information, and it's secured that no one will ever steal it, and you've got access to it. When is that app available? It's available now. We're, we are working with... Um, a, a group down in San Antonio um, with some Vietnam era veterans. Um, you know, the Vietnam era veterans came home to a country that really didn't appreciate what they what they had been through. Um, a lot of them never applied for VA benefits or VA disability um, and, and just got on with their lives. Well, now they're in their, their late 70s, mid 70s, early 80s. 
Um, and their care is kind of scattered all over and their medical records are scattered all over. So what we're trying to do is set up primary care clinics to care for them, use this tool to bring all their medical information together to help them apply for disability benefits and to provide them good quality care um, for that. So we're trying to do that with, uh, with Vietnam era veterans in the San Antonio area. We have another question at the mic. Hello, my name is Jessica. Um, my question for you, it's kind of long. So for um, enlisted recruits and officer candidates that are going through the recruitment process, there's typically a myriad of health screening and questions that come along with it for Northeast Ohio, those candidates go up to MEPS. Um, and with that process, those candidates and recruits are asked mental health questions. And if need be, there's a series of waivers that have to come with it if those candidates and recruits happen to have received mental health screenings or mental health um, assistance previously to trying to become um, a member of the armed forces. Do you think that that contributes to the stigmatization of seeking mental health resources during and after um, they are serving their time? And do you think that there are ways that it can be addressed early on so that when those, when those soldiers come home, they are able to address their concerns in a less stigmatized manner. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. So let me let me break it into two two segments. So the first is the medical screening and mental health screening that occurs as part of the enlistment or as part of the commissioning process. Um, the the reason that that's done is because service members need to be what's called worldwide deployable. You, you, you don't always know when the next conflict's going to occur or where you're going to need to go tonight to, to protect our country. Um, and so you need to be worldwide deployable, which means you need to be in pretty, pretty good physical condition and, um, and good, good health. Um, and so that's why you undergo that medical screening um, to be able to, to say that, that you're going to, to be able to do that. The reason mental health questions are asked is because of what job you might go into. So, so there are sensitive jobs in the Department of Defense that, that you really want to make sure that you don't have someone who's got mental health challenges in those jobs, somebody that controls nuclear weapons, as an example. Um, if that person has got depression, you want to treat the person, but, but you don't want them in the job with their, with their ability to control those nuclear weapons. That's why those questions are asked. D does that create stigma? Um, yeah, it did. But, but I got to tell you, I think stigma is getting better in the armed forces because all the service secretaries and all the service chiefs and, and all the, the leaders make that part of their talking points and have done videos to explain people. And actually, um, one of the things that we put in place in the Navy, and I can't really speak to the other services, um, but, but to get, get advanced in the military, you have to go before what's called a promotion board. And, and, and I've chaired a bunch of these. Um, Anything related to mental health is taken out of the record before the board ever sees that. Um, and, and so as we work hard to make it easy and not career detrimental to ask for mental health, there are things that are being put in place to, to reduce stigma and to make it easier for people to ask for help. Because we want people to ask for help um, and, and then provide it for them when they need it. Thanks. We have a question from our Zoom. Janet wants to know, what has to change for us to adequately support wounded warriors as well as medically underserved citizens? That's a great question. So let me let me um, address that because they're really both the same. You have to have a vision. What are you going to commit to? What does success look like? Uh, and so you've got all these wounded warriors. You've got these underserved populations that we've talked about. What is success? And we can talk about Cleveland with the underserved uh, population if you like. But you have to first start with what is success? And then what are the elements that have to be in place for you to achieve success? Uh, and then what are the challenges in each of those areas? And then what are some potential ways ahead? What are the risks? And then most importantly, what are the resource requirements? And then how do you prioritize that? We don't have that right now be, because um, there, there's a lot of things that are, are um, consuming the attention of our elected officials. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and the focal length for folks tends to be anywhere from two years to the next election cycle. Um, and, and so the ability to step back and create a long-term plan, uh, a vision, if you will, is very challenged. And American healthcare writ large 
it, it's very fragmented. Healthcare in our nation right now is very fragmented. Um, and, and there are perverse incentives in places. You know, I, as, as I look at how do we implement value-based care, just as an example, where the health system becomes responsible for the care and outcomes of its patients, well, does that create perverse incentives so that if you've got a pre-existing condition, um, that then we're not going to take you into our health system? I, I know there's laws against that, but, but okay. Uh, so what's our plan? So I think it all starts with having a vision, identifying what your priorities are, having a focal link that's a little longer than two to four years uh, or an election cycle to get this done and the national will to do it. Uh, and, and so I think that's what's important right now. Um, and that's easier said than done. Uh, like I say, there's, there are people that benefit from the status quo. There are people that benefit from the fragmentation, but there is incredible need um, to look at the wealthiest country on the on the face of the earth that spends more on health care um, than any other nation on earth by a lot. Um, and yet we have, in some cases, outcomes that are below third world nations. We have work to do, but it starts with having a vision. To our microphone. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Faison, thank you. Thank you for your service. Um, I'd just like to, I'm, I'm wondering what kind of... Uh, recommendations would you have to a medical school um, regarding how we can do better for our students that they are empowered and that they are wondering and doing uh, taking care of all of these um, different fields that you spoke about mm -hmm. that are not incentivized because it's a money thing because there's a big debt that they have to pay back. So how do we, what is, what is our responsibility as a medical school to our students to get to that point where we'll get medical professionals that will take care of all of these things that are low paying uh, in the medical field, low paying uh, jobs? Right, right. No, I think, I think that's, a, that's a great question. You, you know, I, I think it starts with Asking, and we talked about this last night. Uh, I had the privilege of being with Dr. Schmidt to talk to some of the students that are in the, the medical leadership program here. Um, and it starts with asking them a pretty simple question. Why'd you go into healthcare? Why'd you go into healthcare? And hopefully it's to help people and to make a difference in their lives. And then exposing them to a couple different things. N number one is taking a more holistic view of some of these underserved populations uh, of what are their needs? It's not just healthcare. It's not just what goes on in the exam room. Um, and looking at how can you get involved with this? Be because if, the, if medical leaders don't get involved in solving some of these issues, they're not going to get solved. Um, so it's, it's doing and helping them to see that their responsibility as a healthcare provider and, and fulfilling reason they went into healthcare, which is to help people, extends beyond the clinic, extends beyond the front door, getting involved in those types of things to be able to do that, I, I think is important. Um, be, being an advocate for some of, some of these different underserved populations, I think is important. Being engaged and, and telling truth to power, I think is important. So educating students from the outset that there's more to your patients than what happens in the exam room, uh, that, that the biggest determinant of their health and their outcomes is gonna occur outside the exam room and outside the clinic, that you went into medicine to help people and to make a difference in their lives. So be involved outside the clinic and in their and in their lives and help them. That's that's what I would suggest. It's it's expanding the aperture, if you will. You know, when I went to medical school, I learned about histology. I learned about the Krebs cycle. I'm not saying I remember the Krebs cycle, but I, I you know I learned about all these different things, the science of medicine, but the art of medicine and of caring for others frequently involves non medical issues that we have to be involved in as healthcare leaders. Uh, and, and again, Northeast Ohio has got many challenges in this area um, that cry for medical leadership to get involved, create a vision, create priorities, create that coalition of support to be able to make a difference. It's not gonna happen just inside the exam room. Thanks. I wanna go from, from that back to your George Washington comment about parents letting their children enter the armed services. Um, at this time, we're at an all-time low 
of enlisting and recruitment. So we just saw Congress a few months ago finally approve uh, benefits for burn pit mm-hmm. uh, issues that that our veterans are dealing with. We're also your stats are incredibly concerning. Is this the reason why we're seeing such a decline, or is it just there's a generational thing and there's no interest anymore? Yeah, that that's a that's a great question. Um, so only about one out of every four graduating high school seniors is even eligible to come on active duty because of physical issues, because of legal issues, drug issues, things like that. So really only about one out of four um, are even eligible to come into the military today. And of those that graduate, the, the, you know, you're looking at the top tier performers in graduating high school classes, things like that. You're now competing with the Googles of the world, with employers that are probably going to pay, pay better benefits um, and are not going to send you someplace where somebody's going to shoot at you. Um, and, and so it becomes a competitive job market to get people to come into the military. I think that's the challenge. This influences it. You know, today, today, every mom and dad, because I, I, when I was a surgeon general, as I would go around talking to folks, um, every mom and dad said, we look at how well you take care of people. Um, and then that helps influence whether or not we advise our son or daughter to go on active duty. Uh, so I think, I, I think it's the reality of, of your ability to come on active duty. I, I think it's um, that it's a competitive job market now um, that, um, that folks have got other options. Um, and, and with each passing year, given that less than 1% of our nation serves in uniform, that then what we're starting to see is a divergence of the military community from the general population. Of those people that do come on active duty, 85% come from military families. So we're not getting most of our recruits today from the general population. They're the sons and daughters of military people that are already serving. Um, and they've all got options. So I think that's the challenge. Another p- question from our Zoom. Much of the talk about veterans' mental health care is dealt with after they return to c- civilian life. Is there ent- any mental health uh, treatment for our active military while they're on assignment and in these stressful environments? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, w- we increased our mental health um, scholarships for, for people going into mental health professions. And this is not just psychiatrists, psychologists, this is social workers and others. Um, and again, I can speak mostly about the Navy, but this is true for all the services. Um, we, we increased by 70%. We started embedding mental health providers into operational platforms. Um, we put in place policies so that if you needed mental health, you know, and, and you go to make an appointment, you know, when you need mental health, you need mental health, not not seven or 10 or, or 30 days from now, um, same day access for folks. Um, and we um, destigmatized to the extent we can. So we got rid of all the signs that said mental health clinic, because that was a big detractor, things like that, made it easier to, to get in. And then we took those young corpsmen and we gave them basic training on mental health and when to when to refer people and when to ask for help. Because if you're 21 years old, you're not going to be talking to a guy that looks like your parents. You're going to talk to a peer. Um, and, and so we found that one of our strongest advocates for getting people mental health um, services was those corpsmen because they were seen as peer. They're frequently the first people that, that folks in trouble will reach out to. Um, so we've put in place a lot of different things to help people get access. And then we invested in alternative therapies, um, you know, things that, that I don't know how it works, but it works. So, you know, I, I don't necessarily care how it works as long as it works, you know, um, acupuncture for stress reduction, um, transcranial magnetic resonance, uh, and some of these things that, that perhaps the, the, the data isn't full and complete yet, but there's enough data to suggest that it's helpful. And we invested in those things and made it easy to get. Another question. There's a shortage of personnel in both military and in many areas of health care. At Neomed, we've been disrupting medical education and models of care with new programs in allied health and advocating for new positions in health care that allow us to train them so others can practice at the top of their license. How has the military leadership dealt with these shortages? Yeah, that's a great question. And again, it's a microcosm of our nation. I saw one of the fact, one of the uh, 
statistics that were um, quoted in the um, uh, the video before we started was the projected shortage of, of medical providers um, going forward because of the rise of competing career paths. My kids are a good example of this, but both of my kids, uh, my daughter will graduate college this year. My son's already in the industry. Both of my kids are in cybersecurity and computer science. And I asked them, I said, hey, hey, what about medicine? You know, the kind of the family business. And, and they said, dad, why would we go through all that training and crawl all that debt when we can get right out, go into a computer job and make more money than you? I can't really argue with that. So we've seen the rise of competing career paths um, that for the first time have challenged the medical profession to say, hey, hey, let's, we need to get out there and say, hey, here's the benefits of a career in medicine. Here is the, the, the satisfaction, the, the, the sense of worth and, and fulfillment that you get from a career path in that. And then we need to make it affordable. So, so one of the things that the military has invested very heavily in is scholarship programs. Um, so we've invested so that you can go into primary care and mental health, and we'll pay the we'll pay the tuition and we'll pay the the expenses for that. And in exchange for for a certain number of years of service, um, you walk away debt free and get on with your life in a, in a career that we need you to be in. Um, for our enlisted folks, um, we've worked with Congress to expand the Montgomery GI Bill benefits. Um, for that, we have a ways to go with that. But but if you come and be part of our team, um, then we will help you go to college and get your degree. Um, one of the areas that we've worked in is our independent duty corps. And we have these young um, enlisted folks that that we make um, basically super EMTs on steroids, um, and they go out as independent practitioners. There's no civilian equivalent for them um, in this. So when they get out, they don't have a job because uh, they're not licensed. They're not licensed practitioners, things like that. But there are there are states where there are huge areas of underserved populations. So we've worked with two states that come to mind is Wisconsin and Virginia, um, where, where we'll take these independent duty corpsmen and put them in these underserved communities to take care of those communities. Um, the state will give them a, a paycheck um, and that will allow them to go to college to get their degree and still have a job. And at the same time, meet an incredibly growing need in some of these states to care for people. So there are a variety of different things that we've done to make it more attractive to go to healthcare. All right. If a doctor has a recent veteran as a patient, are there specific questions they should be asking? I think, I think the most important question is how you doing? How you doing? Uh, how's things going? You know, when, when you transition out of the military, PTSD, TBI, all that stuff aside, you're transitioning from a very different way of life into to a civilian community that for the most part is not going to really understand what it is you've been through. Uh, you know, we, we deal a lot with this, with transitioning veterans um, as they go to get jobs. You know, if you've, if you've got a certain job in the military, those skills may translate very well to the civilian sector. Um, but, but if the folks that the person that's hiring you doesn't understand what it is you did because they never served in the military, that's a problem, getting a job, helping them build networks, things like that. All these different things that, that many of us take for granted are real challenges. So the, I think the most important thing you can ask is, how you doing? How you doing? How's things going? How's your family doing? Um, and then I ask them, are you plugged in with the VA? Um, because what we're finding, and you mentioned this a little bit earlier, is, is not everybody gets the same information about, hey, hey, there's this great organization out there called the Veterans Administration. Um, you know, the one here in Cleveland is one of the top ones in the country, the Stokes Medical Center. Uh, amazing care there. Are you plugged in with them? You know, have you filed for disability benefits? Do you understand your benefits? If you just ask those two questions, uh, how you doing and are you plugged in with the VA? I, I think you will have addressed well over 90% of the needs of those folks. Yeah. No, that's okay. Thank you. Um I just wanted to, first of all, thank you for your service as a daughter of a veteran, a sister of a veteran, and a wife of a veteran. I know very much what the sacrifices of the family and your family has gone through for you to be where you are today. So again, thank you. Um, the question I had, I wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of go back on your wounded warrior thing and kind of tell our medical students and us how can we get involved here in our local community with that those kind of grassroots projects and um, make a difference right here 
in our little community that we have? What kind of advice do you have for us to do that? Absolutely. There are a variety of different ways to get involved with supporting veterans. And it's easy. You know, one is volunteering at, at, at the VA. Um, it's an amazing place. And you go to the Stokes, because um, I, I used to live near near there when I was living in Cleveland, um, and just go over and talk to the veterans. Uh, they've all got amazing stories, but you can volunteer there. Uh, the Marines run Toys for Tots every year. You know, my wife and I have been involved in this for a number of years. Um, and uh, you can go there and meet veterans and, and, and look at support opportunities for them. Philanthropic organizations, there's a variety of different charitable organizations that are actually national organizations. I'm on the board of the Semper Fi Fund. Um, the Semper Fi takes care of, um, of wounded warriors, um, and it provides lifelong case management support, which many don't provide, but you can get involved in those types of things. Um, you can get involved in a variety of different ways. It's just getting plugged in with those, those areas um, that are serving veterans. Another area that's unique to Cleveland, uh, and it's, it's Navy, but, but again, the other services have got, this, got similar things. The, the Navy is building a new ship, the USS Cleveland. Um, and there is an organization, the, the Cleveland Heritage Foundation, um, that is to, they're here to support that ship and to support veterans in the, in the greater uh, Cleveland area that you can get involved in. They do a lot of outreach and fundraising for, uh, for veterans and not just Navy veterans, but all, all veterans. And um, so you can get involved in those. So there's a variety of different ways to plug in uh, and get just, just talk to these folks. They're uh, just got amazing, amazing stories. This is minor too. I, I'm, I'm one for just providing information, but um, I usually do. It was mission 22. Now it could be mission 20, but uh, every day I would do 20 pushups and videotape and throw them on my social media with clues on what to tell veterans uh, who may be considering suicide yeah. and spent 22 days every day and then keep keep putting that information out there because on your social accounts, you just never know who's going to see it. Right. Right. Um, Secretary of Defense General Lloyd Austin III openly talks about the racism he's experienced, even at his leadership level. Many health professionals tell similar stories. What else can we do in both the military and healthcare to bring positive change to the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion? That's a great question. Let, let me let me talk more broadly about this instead of just the wounded warriors because they're, they're, I think they're applicable to both. Remember we talked about the cost of medical education. What we're finding is, and, and you, you gotta have a solid foundation in STEM. Um, you've gotta have a variety of different things to be successful in, in medical education and to navigate that medical curriculum. But what we're finding is as, as that becomes more expensive, we are now disenfranchising certain elements of the population that either can't afford or, or didn't get the right schooling to be able to, to navigate successfully getting into a health profession school and then ultimately being successful to get through the curriculum and, and come out at the other end as, as a um, healthcare um, practitioner. And we need a strategy to be able to do that. Um, increasingly, the medical profession is not reflective of the population that it serves. Cleveland is a very good example of that. Within the city of Cleveland, 60% of the population are black Americans. 6% of the medical profession are black Americans. And there are very good studies that show that if you your doctor doesn't look like you, you are much less likely to follow their advice, which is a real problem when you've got compliance issues or uh, chronic disease issues, and things like that. And that's on top of, in certain demographic segments, um, generational distrust of organized medicine. So we have got to have a strategy to be able to increase diversity um, of the medical profession. That's one of the things that I was privileged to work on uh, when I was at Cleveland State, is how do we get the medical profession, all, all specialties, to more be more reflective of the population that it serves? I, I think that'll be an important prerogative, or not prerogative, an important um, thing that we'll need to do uh, going forward, and a key to success to keeping people healthy. Dr. Faison, thank you so much. As the daughter of a veteran and uh, one who knows very well what you have done uh, for in, during your service, thank you for your service, and thank your family as well for your service. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Dr. Faison. Uh, thank you for that great talk, uh, sharing all the wonderful work you have done in the military and the work you're doing now for our nation's wounded warriors. Um, behalf of the university, a big thank you to all the veterans out there who are seeing this. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance today. We will be continuing the vital series on Thursday, December 1st with our next speaker. Uh, we're expecting uh, Dr. Bernard Fossil to be sharing information on global health with us. Until then, please stay active and please stay engaged to make change. Thank you. Thank you. This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action.